Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, before I start, I, I want to recognize that my brother, just by chance, showed up in San Diego today. And it was really a freakish coincidence because he didn't know I'd be here. And he was looking around for things to do in San Diego. And he thought, oh, there's something called an AAS convention. Let's look at it. So uh, they said, oh my god, Victor Mayer's going to be there. So that's Thomas and his friend Gail Bodor. So um, I first started to notice Cambria Press, I don't know, about five or six years ago. When did you start coming to these? 2000. Eight. That's only four or five years ago. Five, five, five years. And when I first noticed the Cambria booth, I said, who is this upstart? <laughs> and what's she doing here? Who does she think she is? <laughs> With a name like that, Cambria. It has a nice ring, and it, it's a nice font, but you know, where is she coming from? And so for the first two years, she showed up at the AAS meetings, and she was all alone. and. Uh, and the first, I think she only had a few books to put out. And I thought, I sort of felt sorry for her. It was a little pathetic. <laughs> and so uh, I sort of skirted around. I think she noticed I was scouting around, like trying to figure out who she was or what she was doing here, why she was coming, what she was planning. And, um, but I noticed that she was very earnest. And I noticed that she was very hard working. So as years passed by, not too many, it was only 2008 the first time, more and more books on her exhibition uh, uh, shelves. And then she started publishing some of my own students' books. Uh, <laughs> Eli Albers, is he here? No. But uh, Michael Laver, is he here? Yeah. No. But anyway, uh, and then uh, all, of, all of a sudden, a lot of really good books and important books started to come out from Cambria. And I said, got to take her seriously. And then, um, well, I, occasionally I would engage her in discussion by going up to the booth and talking to Tony. And I think she probably felt like, is he a spy? <laughs> <laughs> is he, who's he spying for? <laughs> but uh, so she was suspicious of me, and I was suspicious of her. and. Uh, then, about two years ago, not even two years ago, she called, she didn't call me up. She said, uh, may I call you? She sent me an email, because she knows I hate to talk on the telephone. <laughs> and she says, it's too important to talk, uh, uh, to discuss in an email. So, eventually I consented to a telephone call, and uh, we chatted. She says, I don't know if you'll be offended by this, but would you? possibly consider being the head of a series at my press. And I said, what's the series? And she said, it's going to have to do with Sinophone, with some series. And uh, we talked about it, and it turned out it's going to be Sinophone. And then we had to get a logo, and boy, we had fun working on this. And I really love that, uh, the red chung there. It's so beautiful. And uh, Tony has, first of all, I have to say, Cambria Press has really good design people. Tony's great, but the whole press is full of dedicated staff members. Um, and she's using the most up-to-date technology now to turn books around. You get a book manuscript there. It is very rigorously reviewed. Um, it goes out to two good e evaluators. And if it doesn't pass muster, sorry, you get rejected. Uh, but then once the editing starts, she has very fine uh, editors and designers. So it's a very, very serious operation. And she now has the ability to take a manuscript and turn it around and get it out. Uh, I don't know, how, what's the shortest time you can do it? In a month. In a month. <laughs> if the author to collaborates, it, it can be one month and you'll have a book. Wow. In, in contrast to many presses with, the, with which I've been associated for the last 30 years, it's going to be three years. One, if you're lucky, one or two years, but you should be ready for three or four years to get a book out. Now she's talking about it. And this is not slipshod or fat, uh, just like hasty-pasty or anything. It's very, very serious work. Um, 
So I went, had put that together a board, and uh, there was a previous series at Cambria, and um, I had two or three, three of them come on to this new board, but then I was so astonished because I asked, all the people I asked to be on the board who were really eminent, uh, like David, uh, David Wong from Harvard, and Han So Si, and Shumei, uh, there she is, <laughs> and Tansen, every single one of them just said, sure, I'll be on it. So we had this fantastic uh, editorial board. And now I just want to say a little bit about uh, the books that have already come out. Because in one year, we brought out five books. And they're all great. They're already top books by great authors. So the very first one is called The Classic of Changes in Cultural Context, A Textual Archaeology of the I Ching. Now this is a remarkable book, uh, unlike any other book that has ever been published about the I Ching, the Book of Changes. What the author does, Scott Davis, the author, employs a structural anthropological analysis to um, study the E.J. And it's very inspiring and very illuminating to, to read the E.J. through this lens of structural anthropology. And he also uh, uses musical theory and philosophy and many other approaches in a totally new way to look at the E.J. So after you read this, book by Scott Davis, you'll see that there's a lot more of cultural um, information, cultural data in the I Ching than you might have thought if you just take it to be a book of divination or some kind of arcane uh, 3,000, 2,600 year old uh, repository of superstition. There's a lot of systematic information that Scott Davis teases out of that book. The next book in our series is also an unusual work. It's by Liu Zai Fu, the noted literary and culture critic. I'm sure over half the people in this world, in this room, even if you don't study modern China, you've heard of Liu Zai Fu. Uh, his, actually, his daughter, Jen Dei, is one of the members of our board of uh, directors, ed editors. In this uh, book of Liu Zai Fu, it's called a study of two classics, a cultural critique of the romance of the three kingdoms, uh, and the water margin, uh, so again, this is an unusual book in that it doesn't approach um, these two classic novels as literature so much, but as a repository of cultural knowledge. So this is something we're doing in this series, that we're, we're taking unusual approaches to think, uh, authors and works that have been studied and phenomena that have been studied over and over again, some of them, and some of them are quite new and never studied. Uh, but if, if it's something that's been studied before, we're going to do it in a totally new way. So mm, he's, the Liu Zai Fu is looking at the cultural values that are in embodied in these two novels. Now the next one is also by, I'm, I'm sure that everybody in the room, except for maybe two or three people who live in a hole, um, <laughs> have heard of uh, Gao Xingjian. Uh, Gao Xingjian was the first Chinese Nobel Prize winner for literature, and he was. Uh, no matter what anybody says, <coughs> Gao Xingjian won the Nobel Prize in 2000. And uh, I was very, uh, had the great pleasure of spending a weekend with Gao Xingjian uh, in Boston at the MLA a couple of months ago. And uh, I must say that he's the most engaging and inspiring intellect. And he's not someone who is given to not speaking. He speaks. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was an in-joke. <laughs> David got it. <laughs> so, 
So his book is entitled Gao Xi Jian, Aesthetics and Creation. And so these are essays about um, authorship and the aesthetics of writing. 